In Alabama, March 24th, 1931, 12 black men and a group of white men hopped aboard a freight train heading towards Memphis in search for work. Seeing the black men were on the train, the white men attempted to force them out by throwing them off. The black group in defense retaliated towards the men's efforts and are able to throw them off. In the middle of this conflict, the train was signaled to stop because it was said that there were blacks aboard causing trouble. The train eventually takes a halt at Paint Rock, where police awaited to search the train for the intruders. While searching the boxcars, police were expecting for only blacks to emerge out from the train. But to their discovery, two white women appeared. Afraid of being arrested, the two women convicted nine of the black men to have raped them, initiating the largest cases to ever occur in history. Immediately, all nine prisoners were arrested and sent to Scottsboro Jail, where they would await a trial. Almost instantly, news spread all over town about the two white women who were raped by a group of blacks. With outrage, a large mob of white men and women stood in front of the jail, trying to fight their way in, with the intention of lynching the men. On April 6th, 1931, the first ever trial was about to take place concerning the nine blacks raping the two white women. Thousands from all over gathered around the courtroom to see what would be of the case. A part of this crowd included many whites who wanted to take justice into their own hands because they were so angered by the fact that the blacks would ever dare touch a white woman, not knowing that both these women were prostitutes. The first to the stand to give her testimony was of course Victoria Price. When telling her testimony, Miss Price explained the event in such a way that captivated the hearts of the white jury making the story believable. She claimed six raped her and while doing so abused her in order to get her to submit. When Ruby Bates came to the stand, it was obvious that she was the weaker witness. Unlike Victoria, Ruby was unable to describe in detail what had happened to her the day of the rape. Because of the fact that Victoria was the leader of the two because of their troublesome reputation, she couldn't even identify the four that raped her. Can you identify the men who raped you? Uh, I don't quite know. After the women's version of the event as well as the testimonies from each of the nine boys, the jury of all whites came up with the verdict quickly. All were guilty. All but one of the defendants were sentenced to death by electric chair. The youngest out of nine was the only one saved from death row, but was sentenced to life in prison. Just when it seemed that the Scottsboro boys would have no other fate than death, the Communist Party rose up to speak against the injustice of not only the verdict, but of the people of the South. In an attempt to fight for the boys, large numbers of communists organized a large gathering where they would protest for a new trial. In doing this, news regarding the Scottsboro Boys was spreading all over the country, including other nations. Finally, in 1932, after reviewing the case of the Supreme Court ruled that the Scottsboro Boys must face a new trial because the first one was clearly unjustified. In the second trial, 
The communists made sure that the boys were in good hands and so hired one of the finest lawyers known as Samuel Leibowitz. On March 27, 1933, Haywood Patterson was the first to be tried under a new courtroom and under Judge Horton. Like the first trial, Victoria Price stepped up to the stand to explain once again the day she was raped. Although Price had fooled the crowd, she wasn't about to fool Samuel Leibowitz. When it was just about time for Samuel to speak, he wanted to pin Victoria in her line. With this in mind, he decided to do this by creating a visual demonstration of the train she was raped on. So with the help of others, a replica of the freight train was built in order to pinpoint where exactly the women were and the blacks were on the very day of the rape. So one by one, Leibowitz asked both the defendants and Price to indicate where they were located on the train. After each response, he compared Mrs. Price's statement with those of the boys discovering that it didn't coincide. This wasn't the only lie Victoria was caught in. He recalled her testimony regarding the whereabouts the night before she was raped. Where exactly were you the night before the rape took place? I was with Ruby. We spent the night at a friend's boarding home. Her name was Mrs. Callie Brochi. She lived on 7th Street in Chattanooga. What did the building look like? Was it a two-story or a one-story building? Can you describe what exactly you were doing there? I don't know. I don't remember. I told you that already. After much investigating, Samuel was able to conclude that instead of staying the night at Miss Brochi's, both girls were having intercourse with their boyfriends, which explains the semen that was collected hours after the alleged rape. Even more was when Ruby Bates appeared from hiding to admit that she lied about all accusations. Even when it seemed that all lies pointed to Victoria, the jury's final decision hadn't changed since the first trial. Once more, all were found guilty. Despite the constant failures, Samuel Leibowitz wasn't ready to give up on the boys. Instead, he created a well-argued point, stating how it was completely unjustified to have nine black boys tried in front of an all-white jury. So, a fourth trial began, but Leibowitz lost his right to the case. Taking his place, Thomas Knight takes over and through a compromise, four of the nine boys, Ollie, Willie, Roy, Eugene, were let free after six years of being in jail. Still five remained. After 12 years, Charlie Weems, now 31, was released from on parole. Eventually, Andy Clarence and Ozzy were released as well under the same conditions. Only Haywood Patterson remained from the nine and stayed because he was the most defiant, making him the most hated. It wasn't until 1948 where he made an escape from jail. 